Hey, it's Steve here giving you a pre-message before we get into the episode. I just wanted to remind everyone about our holiday giveaway we're having this year. If you want to win a limited edition steel box of Shaun of the Dead, all you gotta do is go on to iTunes and give us a little review. It doesn't have to be anything long, nothing special, just, you know, say what comes to you. Nothing profane. I'm looking at you, Ryan. And we'll reveal the winner of this steel box on our December 22nd episode. It's that easy. Enough of me talking. Let's get on with the show. Welcome to Analog Jones in the Temple of Film. I'm Steve. And I'm Matt. And we are doing our VHS of The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. Yes, we are. We, oh. don't, even, we don't even have a skit for the beginning here because there's just so much to talk about This here. is <laughs> nonsense to the max. Yes, we have to talk about everything here. <laughs> this is Matt's first time watching. I've seen it now, too. So let's play the intro and come back with the details. Time to fire up the VCR. This one's my favorite. Do you like German folklore? <laughs> um, I I am not familiar enough with it to know if I like it or not. So you're telling me you don't have the original Baron Munchausen book with the adventures and tales of his lies and deceit? Uh, I do not, no. Uh, well, my, good. Well, good. my basis for going into this film was having heard the name Baron Munchausen maybe once or twice in my life in passing about I don't know what. <laughs> First time I ever saw this was many, many years ago. And late night, this movie comes on. I probably come into it 30 minutes. And I just see explosions everywhere and this weird-looking old man with a crazy wig. And then I notice, wait, is that one of the guys from Monty Python? What the hell is this? Yeah, I, this would be... Okay, before we get into like what I really think about this movie, mm -hmm. but I'll just say this would be the perfect movie to come in and out of. Like, you know, th come in 30 minutes, watch it while it's on HBO, go make yourself popcorn while it's still running, and then come back and just see more. That's This is the perfect movie for that. This is a movie that I would say you play at a party, and you turn the audio down, and you don't say anything. <laughs> just watch people's reactions when they walk past it with that, what the hell is going on here? Yes, so, exactly. Let's get into the details before we really let our opinions fly on this. This was released December 8th, 1988 in Germany and March 1989 in the United States. I did not know that. Uh, we originally picked this off of our original format of going back in time on the dates. Yeah. So this will be released on December 8th, or December 8th episode. Uh, whoops, messed up. Well, that's why we've already abandoned it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it's we, we've got so much stuff, and if we try to pluck from the month, we're, we're going to miss out on some stuff that we like have well, to Well, especially cover. our direct-to-video yeah. collection. Oh, oh, the stuff we have planned for January. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> yes. Directed by Terry Gilliam. If you do not know who this man is, pause, look it up. You might be shocked. This man is an animator for Monty Python, his flying circus, and then he went on to be their animator between their scenes and eventually becoming a full member. He co-directed Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Then he came out with his own films, the Trilogy of Imagination, Time Bandits, Brazil, and this, to end it, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. He also came back in the 90s with a really good Fear of Loathing in Las Vegas, 12 Monkeys. We also had The Fisher King. This man has got a really good film catalog. And... He's just, uh, he's so unique. And and next year, we finally get Don Quixote. Uh, mm -hmm. He's been trying to make that f as long as he's been working as a director. We yes. finally get it next yeah. year. Shocking. Uh, I, I can't believe they're actually doing it. I never thought I'd see it. I don't think anyone thought they'd ever see him actually get Don Quixote. And it's done. 
it's finished. It's, we will get yeah, to see it next year. It's actually going to be really. Did they? Re, is I think it's summer. Yeah, I don't know if they have a date date yet, but yeah. it is coming out next year. To me, that feels like a fall movie. Yeah, I probably would do really well in the fall. Yeah. But so they'll release it in the summer, and it'll bomb. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> uh, he also wrote this, co-wrote it. Charles McEwen. M- I'm gonna let you pronounce that. How you? I think it's McEwen. I McEwen. Think right. Yeah, I think right. you're right. Charles McEwen. And he and wrote Terry. a lot of his stuff, right? With him. Uh, he, he did, did a lot Bra- of stuff together. They did a few things. Brazil, yeah, I know Brazil. they were nominated for the mm-hmm. Oscar for. Yes, and really wish they would have won for that, for the sheer fact that it would have been a stamp on Terry Gilliam just winning the war between him and distributors. <laughs> they came back and worked together and also wrote... Uh, the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, which was the Heath Ledger's last movie, and they had replaced him, well, not replaced him, but finished his scenes with uh, four different actors, it, which was, you know, just such a Terry the, Gilliam move to do. <laughs> they did the best they could. He said he was quitting after that. They, he had to be talked back in, and he said, that's why I always pick people that force me to finish my projects. It's, he, yeah. this dude has the worst luck when it comes to making movies. Him and Carpenter. <laughs> yeah, but even Carpenter can get his shit done and, like, yeah, has battles with the studio, but, like, Gilliam, Jesus, every time he tries to make something, something goes wrong. <laughs> well, it's because he always wants to be the lone wolf, like, fighting against everyone. He, there's The movies he's worked together with studios, they've gone over really well, because I don't think there was any fight with Fear and Loathing. And that thing just tore it up on home video. Yeah. But again, home video. It yeah. had to be discovered somewhere else. So still, mm-hmm. it's true. It's always an uphill battle with Terry. <laughs> uh, the writer also has something that I know you'll appreciate. He was an actor in the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. Oh, nice. It we played, might talk about that someday. We might. He also happened to have a role in this movie. He played Rupert, the man with the extraordinary eye and the rifle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he's great in it. We don't usually talk about the producers, but I'm going to bring it up in this one because it's going to be very important in the after thoughts. Okay. Thomas Schlolli, he's German. His last movie ever produced was Alexander from 2004. Ooh. Oh, yeah. What a piece of shit that movie was. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man, this guy in the behind the scenes, he is one piece of work. We'll get into that later. Don't normally mention the producers. Got to mention this guy. It'll come back. So remember it. Put it in the put it in the bank. It's coming back. Our stars of this film are John Neville as Baron Munchausen. He's an English theater actor who moved to Canada in the 70s to get away from Hollywood. He was very successful in running small theaters and somehow some way Terry Gilliam and this crew talked him out of a secure job <laughs> to come back to this and this movie is the first one he came, he acted in for 18 years. Wow. And then he just launched a new second career. Because this man went all the way up to the 2000s until he died at age 86. Wow. It, yeah. How do you... What? <laughs> How did you stay into movies after this production? <laughs> and he had a normal job. Yeah. We have Eric Idle as uh, Berthold, his companion, his... I don't know. Fastest runner in the world. Yes. English comedian, actor, musician, writer, voice actor, most known for Monty Python. He is in a lot. You know what he's great in? (laughs) Tell us. The Casper movie. He's so fucking funny in that movie. That's right. I forgot. 95, right? Yeah. Mm. We'll we'll find out as we do more of these. Matt has a has a penchant for the uh, Casper film series. <laughs> I know you, you. It's some. It's some it's weird something. thing that's in my brain, but I do like them. Well, we found out mine is with Jesus flicks. Oh yeah, we'll get to that <laughs> soon. Or Christian Christian crap. Yes. <laughs> We've got Sarah Polly. Uh, she's she played Sally Salt, Canadian actress. This is when she was a child. She's an actress, writer, director political activist. I know her from Dawn of the Dead and Splice and Mr. Nobody. Yeah, she was, she was also in one of my favorite movies of all time, Go, from the 90s. Yes, yeah. It's amazing in that. So I was really, it took me a while to realize it was her, but I was really excited that I she was in I didn't know this. until I started looking this up. She's got those same big eyes, you mm-hmm. know? She's, yeah, That's, she's great. He actually hired her because of her eyes and her jacked up teeth. Oh, nice. He said he wanted real teeth in this movie because it was being... Was from the past. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. We've also got Oliver Reed as Vulcan. 
He's an English actor. He's always the tough guy, and I remember him basically from this role now and one other role because he was amazing in Gladiator. Oh, uh, yeah? He's the one who gives the speech of, like, you hear the mm -hmm. the crowds roaring and you throw up your sword covered in blood and you win the crowd. He's supposed to be, like, really hard to work with, right? He's an alcoholic, I think. I think yeah, he's, he's super, really... And it was, it well, was kind some of... Some people love... Terry Gilliam loved him. He was really fun to watch in this because I'm so used to seeing his sort of strained, I'm trying to get through this uh, <laughs> no. performance. And in, in this, he was just wild, and it no. was fun to watch. You can tell he's having a blast playing that character, Vulcan. Yeah. We have Uma Thurman as her first acting job, but not premiere because it took so long for this to come out. Uh, she's our first American actress. Uh, she's known for Kill Bill, Pump Fiction. I mean, she is the muse of Quentin Tarantino, according to him himself. Yeah. She is... She, she's always been gorgeous, but she is stunning in this movie. Whoa, hold your tongue here, buddy. She's 17. I'm not saying it in a creepy way. I'm not saying I want to do anything. I'm just saying I don't want stunning. you to go full Kevin Spacey. <laughs> yeah, right. No diddling kids. <laughs> don't diddle kids. It's fucked up. Well, I guess they were allowed to use her. Like, she's almost naked in this film and everything. Yeah. But that's completely fine in Italy. At this time period, you only had to be 16. Oh, okay. Well, that's... Italians! Yeah, whatever. Okay. Whatever floats your boat. We had Jonathan Price as Horatio Jackson, the mayor. He's barely in this. I just wanted to put him in there because he starred in Brazil. Yeah, he's uh, a char character pirate. actor that's yeah. been in tons of stuff. Also, the pirate movies. I'd probably all five. I don't know. Oh, whatever. yeah, he does show up. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's the father. Those movies just blend together to me. I just watched the first two again recently. I love the and, first one. And the first one is so one, good. Yeah. And the second one is such garbage. I love that garbage in the second one. Oh, I love the garbage in the third one, but I'm about ooh, to go back and rewatch it, so we'll see how I feel. We'll come back do, on a mini episode of how I felt about the I third one. I can't do that third one. <laughs> uh, no, but okay. <laughs> we just admitted we both love the trash of them. Oh, I love the first one. First one's great. <laughs> this was distributed by Colum Columbia Pictures right before, or kind of during, when it was bought by Sony. Oh, nice. Yeah, because yeah, RCA is what's listed on this uh, tape here. And it's part of the production hell of this film. We'll get into it behind the scenes. We had a budget of <laughs> approximately 46.63. Wow. I mean, for yeah. the time, that was high, but still I thought it would actually be a lot more. Well, it's a huge movie. It was supposed to only be 25. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge movie, so I'm actually still impressed they kept it under 50. <laughs> this is the great thing. They only released it in the United States, basically. I mean, it was released in Germany, a few others, but kind of just like one-night show type things. This only made $8 million. Oof. They just were contractually obligated to pop it in some theaters, probably, right? Pretty much. And so they just did it, whatever, brushed it off, write it off at the end of the year. Yeah, this was part of a new regime coming in and taking a shit in the old regime. <laughs> oh, truly, truly is. God. Well, maybe the movie kind of deserves a little bit of that, but we'll get into that right now when we break right. it down. <laughs> let's, let's play the trailer for you, and we're coming back. From the director of Time Bandits and Brazil, a new movie full of noise. <laughs> Flying objects. Trust me, madam, your underwear is in good hands. Seafood. Hello. Is there a doctor in the fish? Oh. Celebrities. I'm Baron Munchausen. Mm. That sounds nasty. Is it contagious? Compassion. The Sultan is going to cut off my head. Um. And. Travel. Now you come back here and expect me to follow you to the ends of the earth. Yes. All right. Ah! Oh, no. Have you any famous last words? Not yet. Not yet? Is that famous? Gravity. We 
wave is dropped through the center of the world to come out on the other side. Whoa. He was full of it. The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, a true story. We've got the film to prove it. Well, that's a trailer. Uh, that's a great trailer. For a movie that was sort of brushed off and, uh, you know, Sony was didn't care to bury or whatever, they put together a great trailer for this movie. It makes it look... We're getting into the breakdown, so now I can tell my opinion. It makes it look a lot better than the movie is. <laughs> it kind of just... It lets you know that it's nonsense. It prepares you better. Yes. 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 I needed, tra- a, I needed a preparation. <laughs> I laughed more in the trailer than I did the movie. Yes. Yes. The trailer is a lot of fun, and it's really funny. The movie is... It's Okay, it's not a bad movie, but it is still like an exhausting experience. Well, we're not quite in the breakdown. I forgot. <laughs> we're we're going to go through the box art posters and trailers. Matt, tell us what's on this box art, slip art, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I, I thought we were going into the breakdown. I got a little ahead of myself here. We got to talk about this box still. And let, let's, let's break this down. I saw this cover before knowing anything about this movie, and I didn't like it. I didn't like the cover. It didn't pull me in. It didn't make me want to watch the movie. I saw the movie... Now you know my opinion of it, but I appreciate the cover a lot more now that I've seen the movie. Because whoever did the art for it actually watched the movie. Yeah, so now I get it. I don't think if I saw this cover in the wild without knowing anything about it, I don't think I'd pick the movie up. But now that I have seen the movie and I see the cover, it totally makes sense. So here's what we're looking at. Well, we go to we go to video stores and rent these. We're pretending like we're kids. So that's right. like so. If you're new to the film, this or if you're new to the podcast, that's what we do. Yeah. So we pretend like we were teenagers picking these out on the box art. If I was a teenager, I'm not renting this. Same. I'm passing this one up with this cover. So here's what we're looking at. We've got a red border around it. We've got the uh, RCA Columbia Pictures logo on top, and they they're announcing that they present this movie for somebody who didn't care about this movie. They're really plastering their uh, names on it here. And then we get an image in the center of Baron Munchausen in black and white, no color except for the rose that he's got in his uh, between his teeth. And he's taking his like hat off in like a swipe, and in the swipe we see almost like a painted mural of the different adventures that we see throughout the movie. So we have like the Angel of Death, the girl hanging off the sail, the moon, them in the globe trap, the Venus image of beauty thing, the underwear fucking hot air balloon thing. We've, Pantaloons. We've got the sidekicks that are with him. Uh, presented like in their their healthy young form, with uh, Eric Idle has the ball. yeah when you when you get married you have them uh, ball and chain yeah ball he's and chain. got the ball and chains on his legs because he's the fastest man in the world and he's got these muscly legs. We see a little bit of Oliver Reed and these are all in color. So he's in black and white and these are all in this like swipe mural color. I like it now that I've seen the movie, but yeah, I would have passed because his this tales up. and lies are fantastic. Right, so. We get the title, Adventures, uh, Adventures of Baron Munchausen, and we get the credit block at the bottom. They, they've got the RCA black side for the display side, mm-hmm. which is fun because if you get all the RCA titles, they're all the same. So they all look, yes. they all look nice together. Uh, and then on the other side, it's just the regular title treatment, and same on the top. And then on the back, we get the uh, three stills. We get Baron front and center amongst the Turks that look like they're all trying to kill him. We get this terrible screenshot of the back of some Turks' heads looking off to the sky. I don't know <laughs> what the hell that is. It's a terrible screen. And then we get Venus, uh, Uma Thurman, and Oliver Reed looking like she's being cutesy and he's, like, yelling at her. Again, I don't know what that says about the movie, though. It, it's one scene in the film. I don't know. All right, give us the synopsis. Here's the synopsis from the back, which made me think that this was a more beloved movie than I guess it was. From director Terry Gilliam, Time Bandits in Brazil, comes this extraordinary fantasy-filled masterpiece, slow down, (laughs) that bursts across the screen into the imaginations of anyone who has ever had, who was ever a child. With an all-star cast including John Neville, Eric Idle, Oliver Reed, and Uma Thurman, this enchanting adventure highlights the amazing journeys of Baron von Munchausen. Should have called the movie Baron von Munchausen, it flows better, who set sail in a hot air balloon in search of his old comrades in arms. With the help of Albrecht, the strongest man in the world, Berthold, the fastest man alive, 
Adolphus, who can see you farther than a telescope, and Gustavus, who can blow harder than a hurricane, and also hear better than anybody. The Baron is determined to save the European city against the Turkish Sultan's superior forces. In his travels, the Baron journeys to the moon, visits Venus and Vulcan in an erupting volcano, and lands in the belly of a giant sea monster. And that's just the beginning. No, that's that's about it. <laughs> a fantasy <laughs> yeah. to end all fantasies. The critically acclaimed, is it? Adventures of Baron Munchausen is more than a movie. It's movie magic of the highest order. Color, PG, approximately 126 minutes. Printed in the USA. And we get Columbia Pictures RCA's address on here. I noticed that. I don't... Right I to mean, them. That must, that must be an RCA thing. I, I think know. it is. I think yeah. it's on all their tapes. So, yeah, we get that, and uh, we pop the tape in. And before we get to the breakdown of the movie, I'll just say it. We pop the tape in. That fucking movie just starts right off. No, no FBI warning. No, this has been formatted to fit your screen. No, RCA Home Entertainment Presents. It's just the movie. Yeah, that's disappointing. I was really disappointed in this. Because I have an original release. And, Matt, do you know how I know it's an original release? It was still sealed. That... And this is the only VHS release. <laughs> this is it. They have yeah. nothing. This film's marketing was shit. They did it on purpose. Again, something we'll go into in the behind the scenes. It's crazy because this only has one poster, and then it has the artwork for the VHS. Yeah, uh, the poster, I think, conveys the Terry Gilliamness of it a little bit better because it's the hot air balloon of his head. So he's full of hot air. I get it. But like, Ha-ha. and it shows his little companions at the bottom of the poster. I think the poster shows off more what the movie is better than the cover does. So like I said, the cover makes more sense once you've seen the film. Mm-hmm. But, you know, assuming you're like us and we were just in the video store looking for something to rent, we would have passed this right up. Oh, I mean, now the description, I agree with you, makes this sound better than what I truly think it is. So good for them. But is, if I was a kid... There's no way I would have read this. I would have looked at this. looks like an old man movie. Yeah, this looks, yeah, like an 80s version of like an Errol Flynn adventure movie. And I probably, as a kid, would have passed that up. Yeah, this looks like 50s or 60s type artwork on yeah, the front of this. Yeah, kind of a Dr. Doolittle kind yeah, of looks I'm like. Not. Yeah, as a kid, mm-hmm. I would have passed this up. And then also, that's probably why I've never seen this. Because I probably passed it up a bunch as a kid. Yeah, no go on this uh, as a kid renting it. But we're adults now. And we're going to watch it. So let's break this shit down. Pop it in. Well, here we go. (laughs) The breakdown of this mess... Baron Munchausen. We've popped our tape in. It's our. It's immediately our feature presentation. Let's get into it. We start with the Age of Reason. We see the Ottoman army is attacking some. Fic- we have no idea what British town this is. Right. Uh, I don't. I don't think it actually is anything. I think it's all just not belief. Yes. Like the rest of the film. Yes. A lot <laughs> of explosions. Very violent for the start of this. And it kind of seems more like a pirate movie in a way. Mm. I see all these cannons and everything. Then we get to a play. And I see who's someone playing Baron von Munchausen. And you see just all these actors. You get a shot of the mayor who's going to execute a soldier, which is played by Sting. Who's in it for a second. Yes. And the only reason he's in it is because he was Terry Gilliam's neighbor at the time and just showed up. He's like, yeah, I'd like to be in this. Like, we got a role. Nice. And the mayor's going to execute him because he's heroic? Yeah, because he's done too much. And it's going to be that he wants the town to be complacent and keep their heads down. If you're too much of an overachiever, you have to be executed. Which I think is what where the very little of Terry Gilliam's trademark commentary comes in, I think. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll get into that. We'll get into that. But I believe this is one of the few Terry Gilliam films that I don't understand what they're trying to say. I, th- I think I have mined from it what he was trying to say, but I, I, I could be 100% wrong, but we'll talk we'll, about we'll that We'll see, because minute. he actually told me in the documentary. Oh, okay. Uh, we'll see if and, I got out of it what I he meant didn't, for me to get I out of it. I didn't know. So we've got the play going on, and it's interrupted by the actual Baron von Munchausen, which appears just to be a crazy old man. That the, shows up at this war-torn playhouse. I will say the scene in which they're doing the play, and it's like that very like 
tactile like sets Mm -hmm. with like the the fish that eats him and the water and him floating in and out of the scenes that was awesome i was in on the movie at that point i was like these sets are amazing that they built for this the sets the art direction the costumes the makeup when you first get into the first five minutes of the film you're like wow this looks great yeah content Mm. I mean, the the four Oscars this movie was nominated for are those sets. Spoiler. That's all right. We can talk about it. The set, the sets, the makeup, the costumes. Yeah, it, it's just nuts. But he does bust in, and he immediately starts telling a story of how he survived the Grand Turk when he did a wager for his head that he could provide him with better tasting alcohol, some type of super famous wine, but. I honestly didn't pay attention. There's so much going on that it was hard to pay attention to the actual dialogue. Yes, it was very hard to follow because it's a lot at once thrown at you very fast. So I was, I hadn't zoned out yet. Uh, I'll tell you the exact moment I started zoning out, but uh, I hadn't zoned out yet, but I was just like, okay, they're going to throw a lot at me and there's not, there's, I'm not going to be able to necessarily keep up. So I'm just going to ride this wave mm-hmm. with them. So that's kind of what I'm doing already at this point. I'm like, okay, it's a lot, but I'm gonna, just going to flow with it. I didn't pick up a lot of this until I watched it the second time. I watched it on VHS for the first time and I was lost. <laughs> second time when I watched it on a Blu-ray to get the commentary, I picked up a lot more. And But the problem with that is, is you can't rely on your audience watching it multiple times when it's right. only in the theater once and that's you get one time. Yeah, you get one shot to bring people in and make people fall in love with the movie and uh, it's really hard to do when you have no idea what's going on. Cue the Eminem song. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets in there and he tells the tale. It's going crazy. You see all these by the way, did you notice all the very large fleshy women? Yes. Naked butts. A lot of naked butts. I have no idea what that was about. No. I, it's just... Everything in this fucking movie has to be, like, nonsense and crazy. So, like, if we're going to go to the Turk's house, it's going to be this big, ornate thing. There's just going to be overweight, naked women walking around. Like, everything has to be ridiculous in this movie. It is. I I noticed uh, the executioner in this is blind. Right, the blind executioner. Why? Uh, It's one of the... This is one of those movies, and this so this is uh, something that happens later in the film. But this is one of those movies where even when the characters like fall into water, the water's upside down. Like everything has to be fucking weird in this movie. And for a while, I'm into it, but after about thirty minutes, I'm I'm worn out by it. I'm exhausted by well, how fucking yes. weird everything has to be. <laughs> well, when he sends uh, Berthold, the fastest runner in the world, to go, all, I guess, all the way to England, London, whatever, to pick this up. He, like, runs through the floor, smashes through it. It's very cartoony. Tex Avery, even. Yeah. That's when my brain's like, what, what, what is this? I thought, in my head when this happened, I was like, okay, is this, like, Terry Gilliam trying to make, like, a children's movie? Is this, like, his know. kid's movie? But at the same time, it's Terry Gilliam, so it's weird. I don't know if that's what he was necessarily going for or if he just had that sense of humor where he wanted to see Eric Idle do, like, a Tex Avery run. I don't know. I don't, I don't know, know either. Uh, it just... Because I... I mean, you go to Time Bandits, which I'm not a huge fan of Time Bandits, but I, I appreciate it. Uh, Brazil, I understood, even though it's crazy, I understood what he was trying to say. This one, honestly, 15, 20 minutes in, I, I'm like, what? what is going on? Yeah, yeah, no, I... I I kind of had this this about all of Terry Gilliam's movies. It's like I'm into it for 30 minutes and then it becomes too much and I'm just like overstimulated but hollowly overstimulated. Like I'm not getting anything. I'm not I'm not a crazy fan of his work. I have seen mostly all of his movies and I will continue to see them because I'm always intrigued, but like he always sort of gets me for a while and then loses me. Yeah, I, I have a lot of mixed feelings about this film and a lot of his films. I go back from, wow, that's genius. That's a brilliant way to, to settle that in a script. And then I go, well, that's just nonsense. Yeah, it's yeah, it's too... It's back and forth, back and forth, yeah. back and forth. And I mean, even all the way up to Imaginarium of Parnassus, it was such a hollow movie for how many like visuals he was throwing at you. And like, yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of Fear and Loathing, and I know a lot of people love that movie. I'm not big on time bandits i get it i appreciate some of it i'm not a huge brazil fan i think his best movie is 12 monkeys Mm -hmm. i agree agree. we talked about that yeah so 
He barely gets saved. Bert, uh, Berthold. Am I saying this right? Is it Berthold? I think so. Yeah. Bert, Bert, or is it Berthold? Berthold? Oh, I don't know. I don't, no, whatever. I don't fucking care. So <laughs> he arrives with it. The The Turk doesn't kill him. Uh, I, I love the time um, piece that he has with all the little... It's not even sand. It looks like beads. Yeah, it's coffee sort. beans. So, or cr- coffee grounds is what yeah. it looks like. So I love it. That visual is great. Like I said, he's got a few of these that are amazing. He says, you can... You, we get introduced also to his four companions. Berthold, which is the world's fastest runner. We have Adolphus. Uh, am I saying that right? I think so. Yeah, Adolphus, a rifleman with superhuman sight. We have Augustus, who possesses extraordinary hearing and super lungs. Gustavus. Gustavus. Yeah. And then we have Albrecht. Yeah. Albrecht, which has... He's a giant, super strength. Yeah. That's basically it. He says... You can take all the treasure that a strong man can carry. And, of course, we cut to the scene. And this is when my brain first cut out. We see him, Augustus, or not Augustus, um, Albert, the, the, the giant, grab all this treasure, put it on his back. I thought that was kind of funny. You flip the thing, and then they start fighting. And this is when my brain starts, because it's already, I believe, 13 minutes into this film, and I'm overloaded. Yeah. Basically, he takes all the treasure... Out of out of the thing, so it, he said, this, "All the treasure the strongest man can carry." Well, it's all of the treasure, and that's basically what sets off the war between this English town and the Turks, uh, which is sort of our only like plot of the movie. Uh, this sets off the war, and the story that we're getting, this like flashback we're getting, is because Baron is on the stage with the actor saying, "I'm gonna tell you how this war started." So this is how. Oh my gosh, I've now seen this three times, well, two and a half, or whatever, three. Mm-hmm. I, Okay, that's. I just thought they were in a fight, and he was telling a tale of how he met the Turk from the Ottoman army. No, no, yeah, he was saying this is how the war started. Oh. I'm the reason the war started. Well, I mean, yeah, they escape. Everyone uses their superpower. We get into Gunfire Interrupts the Baron's story. This scene I like. Yeah, he's still he's still trying to tell the story, and the Turks are now blowing up the stage in the little uh, theater area where, which is already like war torn and wrecked and gross. He's being torn apart by the bombs that the Turks are shooting. At yeah, them. so everyone scatters. Right. This is where your chaos should be chaotic. All right. You, you yeah. Have right. This. this is makes sense. This is where Terry Gilliam, I believe, just this is where he excels. He yeah. knows how to do this, and we go back to little Salt, Sarah Salt. I believe that was her name. Yeah. She goes Sally. back th- Sally, Sally Salt. She goes back there, she sees death above him and death looks awesome. Yeah, the the as soon as they showed the death statue outside of the theater, I was like that fucking thing better come back. Yeah. And it does, thank God. And uh, that, that's when I clicked back into this film. Yeah, the angel of death like, whoa. shows up and it's a really cool like costume with the wings and the skeleton. I I dig it. I really am no. into this angel of death and character. He's taking like the the soul, the light out of him and Sally throws something at him fired and just he burst into flames right or she whatever yeah the, the angel death of death is. yeah, yeah it bursts in the flames and goes and it's cool it's cool but that's the moment i'm done i literally blacked out for like a half hour after this i i saw the movie i watched the movie that's why i took notes <laughs> but i literally after the angel of death was like burnt off like this the screen and it's not because i was so into that character it's just like the overload hit me at this point. And I literally, that's when the phone came out. That's when I was like, what else can I do while this is on? <laughs> like, so I, I specifically <laughs> put my phone away for this because I knew I'd do that. But didn't matter. I still paused it. I walked the dog. I was like, I got And this is funny. It's right where I did it too. I yeah, this is it, where I, like, I, okay. I couldn't handle anymore. And, and I mean, to be fair... The stuff I was doing on my phone was the work for you guys. I was looking up trivia and things about this movie, but <laughs> yeah. I still had to do something else to distract me from the visual overload that I was getting on the screen. Yes, it's so much. Oh, jeez, Christ, what happened after this? <laughs> they go, and the, and the play director and everyone's yelling at him, you've ruined everything, we're ruined. And then he meets a very young Uma Thurman, a couple other people, and they're like, well, what are we gonna do? Yeah, so they make something? yeah they make an underwear hot air balloon with all the ladies in the town's underwear. Now I can't remember. Did he ride the mortar <laughs> before this? What's a, oh, that's what's a right. mortar. <laughs> okay, so right when they escape death, they mm. go outside. 
Sally Salt is pissed off. She starts throwing rocks at the Turks who are invading. Oh, and he rides. He grabs the, a the, mortar. Yeah, and he, and bl- sh- he blasts shoots, over the yeah. wall. And then he sees Death again, which I'm confused because Death literally just died like two minutes ago. Well, Death is everywhere. They yeah. just evaded him. That's I, all yeah, I, but I'm confused. I'm yeah. like, wait, so Death doesn't have like a recharge? You know, yeah. this isn't a video game. <laughs> it's just yeah. instantly back. Then he grabs a cannon and flies back and evades him. Or her. I don't know. It. And then we have the underwear balloon. And again, there's so much going on. I've watched this film so much. Oh my god! Yeah, no, it's overload. Like he flies with the the thing, which I've already forgotten, but I watched that scene. Um, and then yeah, he makes the underwear balloon, and they fly in the hot air balloon, of which is the ship. Ooh, it's yes, the ship. Yeah, it's the ship on uh, the poster. And it's the one that's in the play, but it's now like his ship. Um, so he he floats off, which then lands in the water, right? And he goes in the water. No, no, he goes to the moon. I thought he goes to the water, and then it turns to sand. Then he goes to the moon. You're right. See? <laughs> this is okay. it's yeah. overload though. It's overload. Because it's a beautiful shot where the I don't know how they did this either. Well, I do in the afterthoughts, but at first I was like, how the hell the water like sinks into the sand and then the boat just floats on sand, but yeah. it's actually carving through the sand and it goes to the moon. An amazing it's yeah. beautiful. No, like it's gorgeous. This whole movie is filled with this. I I love looking at these things, but I hate trying to comprehend this as a movie. Like that's the thing that's the that's the like dichotomy of this film. It's like I love looking at all these visuals, and this visual particularly was great, yeah. where the water becomes the sand um, and everything like that. It's but, about a good thirty seconds you could watch this, and if you just show this to someone, you're like wow, this is like an art film. Right. If I could appreciate this more as an art film, I guess I would enjoy it a lot more. But because I'm trying to follow the loose story that they have and these characters that we're meeting, I had such a hard time staying with it. It's but the difficult. visuals are amazing. Yeah. Then we get to the moon, and we have the moon king. But before that, they enter with all these like cardboard paintings on... 2D, just like sliding by. Yeah. Very, very cool. And at first I thought, I go, oh, okay, he's getting on the moon, he's simplifying everything. No, they ran out of money. This was supposed to be an insanely large set. But they told them at the end, listen, you ain't got money for any of this. And so Terry Gilliam, and this is another one of brilliant Terry Gilliam's he just took all of his drawings for it, took his markers and his paintings and created all these and slid them on some type of dolly. And it looks amazing. No, I mean, this was a good, this was a case of like taking away the budget, the money, making it work better. He had yeah. to use, they had to use their imagination. And with, it works they better nothing for the left, And it does. It simplifies it. I feel like I came back into the film on the moon. Probably because we get Robin Williams as the moon king and he is a madman. He is coked out of his fucking mind in this, like, performance. Yes. It was, this was, again, too much for me to handle. My eyes were glued to the screen once I realized it was Robin Williams because he's so magnetic of a performer. But he starts talking, and it's utter nonsense, and it loses me again. He didn't follow the script at all. It's all ad-libbed. It's nonsense, though. They said they did a, a couple ones where he was just reading it, and then it just turned into Robin Williams owning everything. Didn't matter. He overshadowed everything. And I love Robin Williams, but when you allow him to go madman, it's, he does this. No. Yeah. I mean, I think this character is a good microcosm for the whole movie because it's utter nonsense. He's magnetic. You want to watch his performance. But it's such nonsense that, like, your brain just checks the fuck out. You can't take your eyes off the screen, but it ain't good. Yeah, you don't, your brain doesn't want to follow it because it's just gobbledygook. You're like, your brain is like, what's happening? And it's like, I can't, I I can't. (laughs) So he, he, he runs into Berthold, which is in a cage, because the Moon King put him in the cage. For some reason, they escape the cage. They meet the Moon King, who's detached from his body. His body's running around like a madman. Robin Williams' head on a green screen. Obvious green screen, by the way. And obvi- I get it. They had no money. He was good, but he was obviously green screened. You're right. And then he's tickling his wife's feet. It turns out 
that the Baron knows his wife and had a romantic history. The Moon King gets mad and then rides a three-headed bird, and they run away, and the bird tears apart, and a piece of asparagus <laughs> flies at him, and I boom! Yeah. No, like... My head just exploded. Like, all that you said, the only thing I think you might have missed is that he, the Moon King puts him in the cage with Eric Idle because he's hooked up with his wife okay. before. And know. Robin Williams' character is, uh, the body is all, you know, it's like the symbol is, the body is just like a horny all the time. He just wants to fuck the queen. And it's just like a dry humping her as like Robin Williams' head is floating around. Um, so the body is Harvey Weinstein? Yes, uh, basically. Okay. And Robin Williams' head is floating around while the body is like fucking around with the queen. The queen's head detaches at one point and she's like moaning as she's helping them escape in her hair. She helps them escape in her hair. Oh from my the god, cage. I forgot that. And she's like moaning because we're, we're to think that like the bodies are having sex even though the heads have detached or whatever. Um, yeah, this is this is this is what's happening in the film. So that yeah, the head helps them escape from the cage that the Moon King has put him in because he was trying to fuck around with the queen and was je- he was jealous about it. And then yeah, everything you said with the dragons and the asparagus and the bullshit. And then that seems just over. Why asparagus? What? What? I don't. I don't even. I don't know. But I, that's I, it though. That's it. That's well, where it like, ends. He crashes, and then the moon turns into like a quarter moon. They use rope to escape, and they fall into an inner... Which, by the way, the the special effects, the animation, the 3D, all that in the background of this, it's awesome. Yeah, no, the the effects are great. But it's hard to appreciate, because my head is cracking. Yeah. Possibly already exploded. Yeah, and there's, like, the the light whales that are floating in the sky. Oh, man, I forgot Under the moon and stuff. So what happened... Okay, here, I'm trying to remember what happens next. So they get off the moon sliver... What happens next now? They, Where do we go next? They fall to the Earth, but they actually go to kind of like Middle Earth. Like the Under Earth. Okay. And I assume... He doesn't even say this in the commentary, by the way. I ass, He just says, oh, they're Under Earth. Okay, so are they in Hell? So li- like a Hell slash Ish. core of the Earth type. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and This uh, is Oliver Reed now, right? This is Oliver Reed. Okay. Which just owns this entire... By He's the way... He's amazing in this. This, I can't take my eyes off for a different reason. This is where my brain hooks back in, and I remember every scene from this. He comes in, they kind of do the little joke of like, we're giants down here, and then he pulls up John Nivelle, and he's taller than him, and he kind of gets that like, he backs off a little bit. Yeah, yeah. He realizes like, oh, shit. Yeah. (laughs) So it's this tough guy. We've got all these people working, and this scene was supposed to be even bigger. This is... In a way, supposed to be people working off debts. Yeah, and but they, they all, never set it up. Yeah, and they all have like Cyclops eyes because they were because working off the debts. Yeah, I, I don't know. And what they're working on, which it, which is I think part of the commentary here, they're working on a nuclear bomb. Yeah. So in the commentary, he goes into this, but this is what Terry Gilliam needed more of in this film. He needed to say something. He says something for a split second in this, and then drops it. You yeah. Know, the, the the little girl character Sally asks, "Oh, well, why would you do that?" And and like Oliver reads, like it, it'll kill the. And we're the, talking about the atomic bomb. The, yeah, right? the atomic bomb will kill the men, the women, the children, the dogs, the sheep, the animals. The, you know everything and then Sally being the innocent child is like why would you do that and then Baron just like where's the fun in that and then like then they drop it then they yes. but like there's there's your there, little there's your sliver commentary. of commentary that's again. what you need more of the whole point is like he says you can sit back from your comfortable chair and press a button and destroy your enemy right Put more of that into the film. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got I got all that from that scene though. So I mean, that was an effective scene, but it needed the movie needed more of that to get the point across. But I got all that from yeah, the scene. So but it was then effective. it's just like boom, done. But then it's back to nonsense. We meet Venus, which is gorgeous. Yeah, Uma Thurman. I don't care if she's seventeen; she's gorgeous. Well, she she's gorgeous in a we are <laughs> old dudes. Appreciating beauty, not well, first of being all, creepy and I, gross about she it. She looks like she's 24, 25 Oh, yeah, yeah. She's definitely mature beyond her years. And she's so good. And this is her first film. Yeah, no, she, she's obviously going to be a star. Yeah. And that, you, again, gorgeous in that you can't take her your, your eyes off of her. Mm-hmm. She's going to be a star. She owns, sure. she owns the camera. She owns the time on the camera. I mean, everything. By the way, it shows her nipples in this. Those are fake. It's makeup. 
Interesting. Uh, Gilliam, the writer, all of them, they didn't want to do that to her. Interesting. Uh, they wanted her to be nude and covered up for, you know, to depict yeah. the, the painting. And she was, everyone was cool with that. Uh, they weren't exploiting a 17-year-old No, girl. it was an exploitation. And yeah, if they were, in the in the VHS, I know you watched the Blu-ray second, but in mm-hmm. the VHS, which I just watched last night, you, you see it for a split second, too. Maybe yeah, in the more widescreen theatrical version, but in the on the oh, tape, it, it's a split second of like so. A, so I checked an these, inch of nip. <laughs> these are both the exact same runtime, which is incredible. They're exact same cuts. Yeah, yeah, but I'm just saying the widescreen you see a little bit more and stuff like that in there. And oh this yeah, is so much clearer. So tame. This is so, so dark. <laughs> yeah, it was it tame. was so tame. But yeah, so we find out the you no, know, not find out, but Baron is interested then in Venus. She looks like somebody who he wanted to marry. Yeah, an and old, they have a little dance off together. An old man, he can't keep his hands off all these women. You yeah. notice that, right? Yeah. Now this, this is the second time. So he dances with her. It's cool, I guess. And, and then I don't and really Oliver care, Reed's kind of freaking out about it like a child, but it's really funny to watch when he's like freaking out about it. Because Oliver Reed is awesome to he's watch. Chewing scenery yeah. like none other. They told him to do that too. Oh yeah, it's great. It's a great. They're like your character. There is no holding back. Yeah, I and mean, he doesn't, and it's great. They good. Tell Oliver <laughs> Reed not to hold back. Tell Robin Williams to hold back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Vulcan gets mad. Sally, Sally wants to leave, so she tells Vulcan, "Uh oh, he's hitting on your wife," and then he just throws him into a magic portal. Yeah, which including is, her, by the way. I, I thought maybe she'd jump in and they no, nope, he nope. throws her. Nope. And he's pissed, so he throws all of them, and this is where I was talking about, where, like, even, they land in water, but because it's a Terry Gilliam movie and because this movie's fucking nonsense, um, the water's upside down, of course, that they land in. So they pop back up, and and then what happened? What's the next, well, like, again, adventure is, we go on here? my brain shut off. Uh, he throws them into the South Seas. They get swallowed by a sea monster. A sea monster, that's right, which looks amazing. And, great and, yeah, great no, creature no, effect. It's, it's awesome. Uh, but the problem is... I believe this is where they should go straight into the fight. I, th- this whole sea monster scene is useless. awesome. But it's useless. Yeah. They, I mean, we get introduced to his other two. Or, yeah, we get the other two. Oh, you know, we never mentioned. this. Is, he finds the giant in the, in the in underground the, In world. the Oliver Reed thing, yeah, yeah. Whatever, no big deal. He finds the giant down there. And so now he goes, they get eaten by the sea monster, which looks amazing and is a cool effect. They get eaten by the sea monster, and inside the sea monster there's like a whole little, like, shack set up of all the swallowed people and the ships and shit things that were swallowed um and they're all playing games and he meets the other two that are left of his group he meets gustavus and dolphus and they're like okay we gotta get out so he sprays some pepper in the air makes the (laughs) creatures sneeze and then they land well the horse jumps into the creature somehow as well oh my god i forgot about the horse the horse jumps into the creature somehow and then they all get shot out together and the horse is floating in the air because Baron's holding his, like, ponytail in the air, and that's how they're floating. I hope we get swallowed by a sea monster so we can end this. <laughs> and, and then the other people are floating on, like, the piece of the ship that's left, yeah. which then starts to sink, and they're like, we got to do something. And they're like, oh, good, we're by the Turks. And in my brain, I'm like, oh, good, we're by the Turks. So, like, there is a resolution coming. <laughs> this is almost over, correct? <laughs> there, and at this point, I was yeah. checking the clock, and I had 20 minutes left. And I was like, good, we've yeah, got 20 I, minutes left. I can do this. <laughs> I guess the Baron then wants to fight the Turkish army, but his comrades are all old. And can't do it. So he, doesn't he surrender? He goes to the Turk, he's going to cough off his head, and then they rescue him. Yeah, the base, basically that's it. He, they, he's going to do it, and then the team comes together. You know, the fastest man runs again. Uh, the guy with the steel lungs blows the guys away. The the other guy can see far. I don't know. They I, all do their I, thing. I did laugh at the, do you have any famous last words? And he goes, not yet. I laughed at that. Yeah. Then I sort of chuckled at the blind executioner who just like why is your executioner it's not i'm not laughing with the film i'm laughing at the film at that one like why did you do this well why did you have to do this why is this in here (laughs) they single-handedly defeat the army i they defeat the turks yeah they they basically it's a very quick resolution you can tell they're out of money yeah they basically it's a ton of like the trailer says it's a ton of noise 
and a lot of explosions and a lot of things. The strongest man throws the ships away. Everybody goes running away, and that's it. That's it. It's over. The fight is over. Baron's the hero, and the town welcomes him, and is like, yeah, Baron hero, he saved us. And Jonathan Bright just fucking shoots him. Yeah. <laughs> death finally gets him. Yeah, death takes his life force ball, soul of fire, and death goes away. Baron's dead. He's buried. They have a funeral for him. It's all, you know, it's nice. Sad. The movie's no. the movie's over, and the Baron's dead. And then we cut to back to the stage, and he's done telling the story. Yeah. And I'm like, motherfuck! Like, yeah. why did yeah. they have to go this, this way? This pissed me off. Yeah. And I'm it, and it makes and I I get that it makes no sense. This movie's nonsense. But like, it. It's so baffling why they had to do this. Is probably an effect of losing money or whatever. But like, no, this is part of the original script. Well, that's fucking garbage then. Yeah, because yeah, it's such a cop out. The story's over, and then the commentary comes back again, where you know the Baron takes them to the walls where apparently the Turks are ready to burst in and kill all the townspeople, and they tear down the walls, and no one's there. And literally the enemy is the fear that's being put on them by the mayor, which is more of the commentary again. But the commentary's not consistent. No, no, this is it coming back oh, no. for the first time since... I'm yelling at the film. Oh, I know, I know, I know. Uh-huh. And I'm saying this is the first time it's coming back since the atomic bomb thing. Uh, so this yeah. is the first... So it's like, yeah, once the people rise up against the fear, the mayor is only one person, the town is more, the town has to rise up against him and break down the walls of fear that the Turks yeah. are out there. There's no one out there. The town is free, and the mayor is powerless. Here's my personal thoughts. I understood all that. I'm like, yes, the the fear is not there. You have the ability to override, blah, 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 yeah. blah. But here is my personal reaction. I don't care. Well, at this point, this is the last, like, two minutes of the movie. Yes. Yeah. Because then, after that, the town rises up, everybody's happy, the film is over. Well, well and Sally asked... It wasn't just a story, was it? And I looked at Sally and I go, "Yeah, it wasn't, was it? <laughs> yes, it was." Yeah, and he's—I guess the thing that ties it to the, the story being real is he has the rose still from when he was with Uma Thurman, Venus, and he gives it to the little girl instead of Uma Thurman. And it's like yeah. it wasn't just a story; you have the rose from the story. And I guess well, that's supposed to say, be the, he doesn't say anything; he just rides off with a grin. Yeah. And it's like, I get what they're trying to do with that, but, like, fuck. Like, come on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was like, no. No, I liked it when he died. He, he died for to save everyone. Like, in the tale like that. Yeah. Maybe maybe come back with the girl as an adult telling the tale? Yeah, or, or something. you can give it still a happy ending, but leave the Baron dead. It's over. <sighs> I don't, I don't. Or, or have him, like, just be back alive and be like, I fooled you all along that I wasn't dead, but not, not it was a story all along. You know, there's got to be another way to have done that that was better. I don't know. Aggravating. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's that's Baron Munchausen. And basically, I think our thoughts are, once again, the yeah, same on fun. this, where it's just like great visuals, not a terrible movie, not a bad movie, and a lot of really cool stuff to look at. But trying to follow some semblance of story for two hours and six minutes is frustrating as hell. Yeah. Sarah asked me, she's like, oh, what's the movie? I told her, did you like it? And I looked at her and I go, I don't know. (laughs) I I don't not like it, but I don't like it either. Yeah, I don't want to watch it. Yeah, it's too exhausting of an experience. Like you said, it's a movie you put on at a party and let people marvel at the visuals. But if you try to follow it, it's unbearable. Like I said earlier, too, if you catch it on TV and you catch some of the cool visuals, that's the way to see it. Mm-hmm. When you try to watch it as a film, too much work. All right, here's one of Robin Williams' scenes. I'll just let you listen to it, and we're going to come back here with the behind the scenes, which is just as bonkers as the movie. <laughs> oh, it's so embarrassing. Please don't look. Maybe you'll go away. Oh. It is hard to believe my body and I were ever attached. We are so totally incompatible. I mean, he is still dangling from the food chain, and I am in the stars. Oh, it is so unmetaphysical. No! No, go away! No! I despise you! Let me go! No! 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 I'm back! I 
get lips again, and I'm gonna use them, baby. <laughs> it's me. I'm your elephant of joy. Oh. 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 <laughs> Give me but your baby. Oh, <laughs> That's right. You gotta manja before butch. <laughs> well, there you are, Robin Williams going insane. Yeah, just tune in out. I tuned it out. I just tuned it all out. <laughs> Behind the scenes here, and this is, like I said, maybe just as bonkers or more bonkers than the film. We had budget insanity with this. They asked for 35 when they went to Columbia. Columbia fought back and they're like, we want to make this film. David Putman, the president during the time, he's like, but we can only give you 25. This is when the producer does a just bad, he's, he's, shitty at his job he says yeah no problem and then he claims that it was underneath the table silent that it was going to be 25 on the books but really it was always going to be 30 to 35. dude you get that shit on paper because that means nothing but it's even more than that so this film is a record it went to 46. gilliam denies that even though it's kind of been proven mm. whatever well and i'm uh, sure did they go over in time and stuff they like that went too? over so fast I mean, that's that's a Terry Gilliam fixture, going over budget and over time, though. But this one was just like the epic <laughs> Terry Gilliam one. A lot of the other ones, he goes over time and over budget, but it's not that much. Mm. It's enough to irritate people, but you get a better product. Yeah. This one, you can see all the money on, on the actual film. Oh, yeah. But the film's not good, in my opinion. Right, right. The, the content isn't there, but all the money is on screen, for sure. But the producer was so bad at his job, so much went wrong. And then he tries to claim like, oh, they just wanted to use me as the bad guy because I'm German and they hate the Nazis. <laughs> this is in the documentary, oh the misadventures God. of it. And I'm like, no, dude, you did a bad job. Yeah, like you had one job to produce this movie and you fucking didn't and, and, do it. And it was shit that went wrong that, how do you not know this? They were paying people to build sets that were, instead of charging them, say, 10,000, they were charging them 30. Terry Gilliam tells a story of when he knew he was in trouble because he goes to this exotic bird trainer and he's like, I need this many exotic birds. And the guy's like, $10,000. Terry Gilliam goes, I ain't got that. I got a thousand. Bring what you can. And then he's like, he brought all of them. So you can see what type of production yeah. problems they had. Yeah. We get to the real problem of everything is the regime change. Sony came in and bought them fired David Putman, which they had all oral agreements with. And then we get into the new guy, David Steele, coming in. Really, that's his name. David Steele. David Steele comes in and says, I don't fucking care. Doesn't matter. Get this thing done or we're shutting you down. Yeah. And they did shut them down for two weeks. Luckily, they talked them into letting them bring in other people. Almost fired Terry Gilliam. He talked his way back in. Actors were mad. It was hot as hell in Italy. Everything in this production was bad. But I do give them credit. When you look at the film, you can't tell. Yeah, I mean, the movie it doesn't feel like a movie that's losing budget, I guess, until the ending when it sort of falls apart. But, like, the, the rest of the movie, I mean, all the money's on screen, and it looks good. Yeah, but, I mean... They like went $20 million over budget. I mean, this the over budget, almost getting shut down, getting shut down, again, par for the course for Terry. <laughs> Here's more of the production hell. Not only were the Italians crooks, but they couldn't talk to them. They only had one person who spoke English and Italian... And that was the set designer. You would say something to the Italians. The Italians would respond back to you in English, but their English meant something else. And another thing with the Italians is, the Italians aren't so much as the director is God. They're more about, the, he's the manager. And right, it's more the of a work thing, yeah. Cinematographer is like the God. Their main cinematographer in this was giving orders that they shouldn't follow because Terry Gilliam should be the one giving the orders. It was just nonsense. And they called it chaotic management <laughs> like they'd be doing all this stuff nothing would look ready and then they'd record and it looked good and that they're like that's how the italians did it <laughs> and terry gilliam talked about it he's just like that's i won't ever do it like that i want to go to britain i want to go to the u.s we're structured we have schedules we have set times and shoot times and all this stuff has to be dressed and rehearsed the italians were just like wham figure it out yeah i mean the fact that they were able to put together 
a movie out of this, even though the movie's nonsense, is still amazing because yeah. they could have just not finished things. You know, this is a completed movie. This is yeah. top to bottom probably what they wanted in the movie. So it's amazing they got to put it all together, but it's just, yeah. it's nonsense. Here's even more. They were training horses in Rome, but they couldn't bring them over to Spain where they shot the actual Turk uh, when he first meets him and tells the story because Spain was having a horse fever. Oh my god. So they couldn't bring them over there. They wasted all their money on that. They cut the scenes with the horses, and they went back to Britain at the end and shot with the horse. It was nuts. And on top of all of this, in the first ten days, they only had 17 minutes in the can. Whew. They said within two weeks, this movie was over budget. Oh, yeah. Because the sets that were being built were enormous. And here's one of the stories. They told the Italians, hey, we need cannons. So they built cannons, literally. (laughs) Usually you'd build them out of, I don't know, foam or whatever. Yeah, just like foam and Maybe have like like, like a burst out of them up here. No, four of them actually shot cannonballs. Jesus. And then they charged them to move them because they were too heavy. So they had to move them from the where they were built to the set and that cost more money and then they told them like don't worry we won't charge you i got a guy with a with a truck and then they charged them they get a ten thousand dollar check you know it was just insanity this is why this producer your job is to make sure this doesn't happen and this entire movie is just about you not doing your job (laughs) like i get terry gilliam's crazy and he doesn't understand money but he's open about it yeah this is why he gets people producers that know what they're doing yeah this guy awful (laughs) and the only other movie i know about is alexander from 2004 and that movie's awful yeah not a good track record (laughs) getting a little excited here (laughs) because it's nuts okay so you haven't seen the documentary of the misadventures no i just watched the tape you do know eric idol yes he called this and i quote a horrible experience hollywood is full of liars and they're all terrible people (laughs) That's his quote. Like, <laughs> and he's talking about how just like everything is full of shit in Hollywood. Here's another quote from him. I'd always been very smart about Terry Gilliam films. You don't ever be in them. Go see them. Go see them by all means. But to be in them, fucking madness. <laughs> yeah. And this shoot was supposed to be two to three months. It was supposed to be 60 to 90 day shoot, which turned into six months. Woo. I can't imagine... You know, that's that's all the work you do. Like, as an actor, you want to bounce from project to project. Like, if you're only working on one thing for six months, that's your half your year is on one film. Within two weeks, they were already doing all night shoots because it was so hot in Italy. you got to remember, you got a nine-year-old girl. Yeah, who you got to shoot with animals, with the horse and, th- and a kid. Already you're having too much trouble. We have more tales of craziness. Sarah Polly, this is her quote, It was a traumatic experience. It left me with a few scars. It was so dangerous. There was explosions going on, and I'm just a nine-year-old. It was physically grueling and unsafe. Woo. Yes. <laughs> we got the production designer inside of this documentary. Terry is more of a film author than a director. He's very elastic, and that's one of the qualities and a director that I admire the most. But he also went on to say, the problem was is he just would take all the ideas and try them. Right. Uh, one of You could things, tell that yeah, when you watch the movie. It's too much. Yeah. And this director, production designer, he, he's like, we had a script. But then I would read the script and prepare the scene, and then he would come in and he's like, yeah, we need a pool in the middle. We're going to have the Turk in the pool. He's like, Bleh. That we don't have a pool. Make it. Oh my God. Yeah. Now you start to see why the money just gets burnt up. Yeah, you can't do that. No, that's not how this works. Well, it does for him, apparently. I can't even imagine, and I told you this, if I was a studio, I would never produce a Terry Gilliam movie. No, no. If I was a producer, absolutely not. And I mean, it's like I, it's like Eric Idol says, you see them. You want to see those movies. You want to see the visuals. But getting one made... No, 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 no. I wouldn't touch that uh-uh. one. No. Mm-mm. I don't know if I even want to work. He reminds me of... Kubrick. Kubrick. You want to watch them, but you don't want to be a part of them because it's going to be grueling. What ends up on screen may be awesome, Yeah. but it's going to kill you doing it. Well, even on the even on the, like, the trash end and the bad movie end of things, like Michael Bay, 
visual marvels, mm -hmm. but you don't want to work with the guy. The dude's fucking insane. So, uh, yeah, it's it's. Well, I can watch some Gilliam movies. It's well, I can watch some Michael Bay. Oh my God, you're right. I can't. I got to get Michael Bay out of my mind. <laughs> then we go into Robin Williams. This gets incredibly interesting. He basically did this for nothing and for a favor. He heard that they were having problems. Gilliam might get fired. He was interested in the Moon King scene. He came over and did it. Most likely, I'm assuming he did it for drugs. Because what he put on camera, he must have been coked out of his mind. Oh, absolutely. His people refute, fought. They did not want his name on this because they were afraid he was going to be pimped out. Yeah, and, and he absolutely would have. He probably oh, yeah. would have been second build on this movie. Or first. Yeah, and Well, no, his, probably John Neville would have got first. And then his face would be all over every poster, every... Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely would have gotten pimped out, so for sure. he decided to credit himself as Ray Di Tutto, which is a translation from Italian to English of King of Everything. There you go. <laughs> I don't know what that... Okay. Interesting enough, Sean Connery was supposed to play that role. But the role was cut down so much and changed that when Sean Connery read it, he's like, "I, this isn't me. Yeah, and it wouldn't have been. I don't think even if it was a serious, like a more serious performance and not as silly as Robin Williams did, it, it still wouldn't be a Sean Connery role. Imagine this. Marlon Brando was interviewed to be Vulcan, and Terry Gilliam wanted him to be Vulcan at first until he met him. Yeah, he's supposed to be a... The real doozy to work with. After reading most of the memoirs here on Terry Gilliam's book, which we'll get into a little bit after this, I really want to read something on Marlon Brando. I don't know if it's out there. I'm sure it is. Wow. I've yeah. never heard anything good about this guy. <laughs> no. Well, other than the fact that he's an amazing actor. When he wants to be. Well, yeah. I mentioned this earlier. I don't know if in this or whatever. He came back to Columbia right after this and did The Fisher King can't believe they invited him back yeah i mean i know it was a different regime but still but still they, they know his track record but yeah. fisher king which i have not seen is considered to be his masterpiece so By i guess some, yeah I, I really want to see it and i don't know why i haven't haven't seen tideland fisher king and jabberwocky of his movies oh jabberwocky is his first one right uh, one of his first like ones. 78, yeah, 77. 77, I think. Uh, I haven't seen those three, but Tideland and Fisher King are often considered to be his best, so I guess I missed out on his best movies. <laughs> I just think I, I paid attention to his, like, just pure imagination ones. Right. Yeah, so I want yeah. the visual ones, even though the stories sometimes mm -hmm. leave me hollow. Yeah. The movie was released in the U.S. with only 117 copies. Gilliam's quote, It's bullshit. Even art films get around 400. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Right, right now, uh, in theaters, even uh, Three Billboards is in 400. Well, screens. what about uh, Lady Bird? I'm yeah. I'm sure that's, yeah. that's probably even more now. Yeah, like, that's insane that only 100. Yeah, that's like nothing. Nobody could get to see that. No, that's why they made so few. I mean, even 117, they somehow made 8 million. It yeah, was a tank job. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a purposeful let's sync this movie, but I feel like at the same time, the ratio, making $8 million on 117 screens is actually pretty good. Yeah, I'm amazed so. it made that. Once you, once you know that, once you know it was a tank job on purpose by Sony, to, I mean, honestly, the old regime, uh, the final books, they can look at it and be like, they have no idea what they're doing. $46 million only made $8 million. Yeah. You don't have to put in the details if it only was released 117 right, films. Right, right. Now the reception. Matt. What do you think the reception is by the critics? Well, according to the back of this VHS, apparently they think it's a masterpiece. True. Okay. Okay. And I can't... 93% on Rotten Tomatoes. So so critics loved this movie. Loved it. Okay. And... I could see that. It's he, stuffy. Of course they loved fans it. Fans liked it. Okay. We are in the minority. Once again, the, the syndrome of the Ladyhawk. <sighs> 69 out of 100 on Metacritic, 11 out of 16 critics gave it good. None of them really gave it a bad. I guess that's why it has a 16. I don't know how Metacritic works. Yeah. I don't really care either, but 7.2 on IMDb. Wow, so this is up there. Yes. This is almost as high as Baby Driver, which we talked about last week. <laughs> of the old regime of Columbia, this is the second best reviewed film behind The Last Emperor, 1987. Jesus. Ebert gave it three out of four stars, said it was told with a cheerfulness, a light of 
a light of touch that never, never betrayed the time and money it took to create it. Washington Post, wondrous feat of imagination. So many, on and on and on and on. Wow. That's really, I mean, I'm not surprised, I guess, but uh, no, you know, I am a little surprised. No, I am. I am surprised. I, 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 I get it. It's visually amazing, but it's, it's so little there to mine from. As a coherent film, I think this is bad. Well, it, 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 it doesn't commit either way. It's not a full art film, and it's not a full narrative, cohesive story. So without it committing either way, it sort of falls in the middle, which makes it, yeah, so that you can marvel at some things, but be left wanting more on others. Anyway, let's get into the awards. So, yeah, one of the things I looked up was the awards that this was nominated for, uh, particularly the Oscars. That's one of the first things I started doing when I was drifting. So it was 1990 Oscars because the movie came out Mm -hmm. in 89. And it was nominated for four, which I think at least three of them were justified. And that was Best Art Direction, Best Costume Design, and Visual Effects. It was also nominated for Best Makeup. Yeah, I don't know about that. But the other three, absolutely definitely deserve to be nominated art direction though it ended up losing to batman which i agree with batman was superior that year i think to definitely put you in a world can't argue costume design lost to henry v i've never seen that i don't know if it has better costumes whatever and the best visual effects it obviously lost to the abyss which was a fucking trendsetter for the days of visual effects so yeah, that's it's, hey, you're nominated. That's a that's a win. Yeah, so you're nominated, not beating the abyss. But you're not beating the abyss. Best makeup it lost to Driving Miss Daisy. I don't know what uh, makeup there was in that British Film Academy Awards. Uh, it won three costume design, makeup, and production design, which we just talked about. Did it win? Won oh, three, okay. and then it was nominated yeah. for best special effects, which lost to Back to the Future Two, which had some decent effects, but not the Abyss. Come on. What? Uh, Saturn Awards. It was nominated for four costumes, fantasy film, which was lost to Ghost. Recall. And Total Recall was costumes. And Dick Tracy. Uh, oh, makeup okay. and lost All to right. Dick Tracy. Yeah, which I'll makes sense. And then yeah. once again, special effects lost to Back to the Future 2, which, I'm oh, sorry, the Abyss takes it that year, though. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it won the 1990 Italian National Syndicate of Film Journalist Silver Ribbon for three categories, cinematography, production design, and costume design. And it was nominated for a Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation, losing to... Indiana Jones and Last Crusade, which is my least favorite of the Indiana Jones movies, but whatever. And actress Sarah Polly was nominated for two Young Artist Awards in Best Musical and Fantasy and Best Young Actress. She was good. She was great. Yeah. I, I've got no complaints about her. No, she was a great kid actress, for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely set the set the pace for her being one of the most acclaimed actresses and an Oscar nominee as well. Yeah. Uh, for screenwriting, but still set the, you know, pace for her future career, which was pretty great. I didn't know how good she was until this movie. So at least I got that out of this. Yeah, I mean, she's she's considered, I mean, yeah, she's done schlocky things like Dawn of the Dead and Splice, but she's also considered one of these great indie actresses for all the movies she's done, and then, yeah, the one that she wrote uh, away from her, so. Really didn't like Splice. You didn't like Splice? No. Oh, I like Splice. Oh, that, it's funny to hear the difference of opinion on Splice. I liked it. I didn't love it, but I liked it. Well, same uh, thing with uh, Dawn of the Dead. Oh, man, that's extreme. I love Dawn of the Dead. I love that's Zack Snyder's yeah. best fucking movie. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's his masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go into Gilliam's book, his memoirs. All right. Because this is nuts. This is when I found out the producer fired four accountants until he found one to get it right saying they could do the movie in the $25 million budget, which clearly was bullshit. Yeah. It's just an awful producer. And I also hate that he uses the excuse, oh, they didn't like me because I'm German. No, they didn't like you because you can do your job. Then we get into the Marlon Brando. Holy shit. This is fabulous. I've marked these in this book multiple times. One, Marlon Brando's head, according to Gilliam, is massive. It's even bigger than Richard Nixon's. And it seems to be carved out of marble with the brow that never ends. <laughs> That's awesome. They started talking about another movie he was in called A Countess of Hong Kong with Sophia Loren. And then he talks about how he just had complete disdain for her. And one time he made her touch her toes so he could dry hump her. Ew. That's to, gross. Yeah. But this is even better. According to Gilliam, the whole reason he did this is because he just basically wanted to show him that he could touch his toes. Because he bent over and he's like, look, I can touch my toes. Okay. 
And then <laughs> Gilliam goes into fuck. it. Yeah. He's just like, Marlon Brando actually cared about what we thought. And the only reason he would bring up stories is so he could tell something about himself. Oh. And it was almost always derailing someone and then showing his skill. Sounds about right. He shat on the producer. Now, Gilliam at this time, I, I still believe does, like the producer. Marlon Brando did not. Listen to this quote. He was giving him a hard time. The producer, Thomas, such a hard time. He's a huge fan of you, but you're shitting all over him. Why would you do this when you don't need to? And so they invited him to a party, and he continued to just... They knew they weren't going to get Marlon Brando. And at this point, they didn't want him. Right, yeah. So they invited him to a party. He comes over to Katner's party, and when Brando saw me from across the room, his curious gaze was fixed on me in, what's this guy's game sort of way? I never got to find out how far my proactive strategy would have taken us because I said to Thomas that the only way to get him was to call his bluff with the whole getting a skew to come out and pick up his Academy Award thing and tell him we'd pay him $2 million. But only if he donated his entire check to the American Indians. <laughs> they never got a call back. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, I love it. Funny. And it goes on more about just how Brando was fat. Yeah. And he's coming up the stairs. He avoided, like, the welcome party, and he came in through the back, and he just sees this man in a huge white suit moo-moo thing oh, coming up the stairs, huffing and puffing. We should, uh... We should do Island of Dr. Moreau at some point so we could talk more. Do you have the VHS? Um, yeah, I do. Oh, you're... We should do that because we got... There's so much to talk about with the Lost Soul documentary and then the things that have been written about that and just Marlon Brando, just in general. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, let's so, take a pause. We'll come back with what's in the museum and our afterthoughts. This is the second time I've had to reclaim my property from you. That belongs in a museum. So do you. Here we go. Analog Jones, we always stick something in the museum, whether it's bad, whether it's good. Are we going to learn from it or marvel from it? Matt? I, I, You know, there's a lot to learn from this movie, but I'm not going to put a lump of coal in the museum. I'm going to put something in it that I actually really liked about this movie. Uh, I, I, like I said, I liked them, so many of the visuals in it, but my favorite was early on in the film, and that was the uh, stage production of the Baron story so we get to see these tactile waves and the monsters swallowing them up and things like that that whole stage set is going in the museum because that was an incredible marvel to look at I bet that was all completely fully working too oh it had to be like the way the way it moved the way it, it was it was so that that was it was functional it had to be so yeah, I'm I'm putting that that was pretty amazing in the museum. I do think there is, you know, the sake of the museum is to have things you know we can learn from or the gold that we find and stuff. But I do think there's a lot more we could learn from here. But I got a favorite thing, so I got to do it. I have a small lump of coal to put in a museum. Okay. This film left a bad taste in my mouth. Not so much from Gilliam's fiasco, mostly from the producer and the actual distributor and everything. This was a movie about a liar who tells tall tales because he can't live in his own reality. Made by people who lie to yeah. get a movie made. Right. It's liars making a tale about a liar. Yeah. It's insane. And everyone knows this about Hollywood, especially in the big production companies, but we keep on eating it up. Because <laughs> we want to be entertained. Right. Yeah. No, that's a good one to put in the museum. So it's... it's <laughs> Liars making a tale about a liar. I like it. Good. It's, it's deep, but honestly, it's not that deep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's our museum for the uh, week. I think my my afterthought with this is um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to mine my political commentary out of this that I think he was trying to put. Let's do it. Go. This is what I think, and you could you listen to some of the commentary. You could disprove it if I if you think it is. Obviously, we talked about the stuff at the end and the uh, warhead, but what I think he's mostly talking about is war in general because of the way the movie's set up and the horrors of war and how you know we turn to entertainment in times of war because that whole theater is filled when they're telling the story of Munchausen as they're literally getting bombed. But also, I think he's talking about what a joke war is because literally they're saying the beginning of this war is because of 
a bet that Baron had with the the Sultan about which alcohol was better. And when he, you know, Baron wins the bet and takes the gold, that's what spurs on this entire war. And you know, it's it's based on gold. So I mean, there's there's the money aspect, you know, which always ties into war. But the war is just started with such a joke by two powerful people. And I think that's sort of the commentary he's trying to lay in there. And then, yeah, we come back to war again with the with the warhead, the, the atomic bomb. And then, yeah, in the end, it's fear that keeps us down. You know, a, a fear of war and everything like that. His trilogy of imagination came down to this. The Time Bandits was how our imagination can capture us and propel us yeah. as a kid, from the kid's mm-hmm. point of perspective. Brazil was about how we're men and we don't accept our reality around us. Instead, we create this one where we think we're actually getting ahead when we're not. Mm. And this one was all about an old man's illusion, delusions of grandeur, what he's done. He's telling people a tell of what he wanted to be, but not who he is. Yeah. I honestly think what you just said might have been better than what Terry Gilliam explained. <laughs> and I think I do think that's what he's putting in there because obviously all of his movies have some sort of commentary, whether it is political, like a war situation, or personal, like Brazil and uh, Time Bad, it seemed to be more about. But uh, there's well, always something there. And that you told me to see if I could find something, and I, I that's what I found when I watched it. Uh, Matt, what are we doing next? Is it uh, Star Wars, right? Yeah, so excitingly enough, so this is airing on uh, December 8th, 8th yep. my birthday. Wish me a happy birthday. Happy uh, birthday! <laughs> buy his movie! Yeah, buy Take Back the Knife. Uh, buy it directly from me if you can find me on the Facebook, because then all the proceeds go back to where it came from. So <laughs> buy it directly from me, Take Back the Knife. Hit me up. I've got copies. Next week... So it's the 15th. It is the day Star Wars comes out. We're going to do something kind of crazy. We are going to watch it, and then we are going to talk about it, and we are going to post it the same day. <laughs> there will be no editing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we are going to go, we're going to kind of do it live. It's going to, going to be like it's our first yeah, live episode, be, sort of. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to have... Uh, it's going to come out on Friday. Well, it's going to come out Thursday night. That's when we're probably going to end up seeing it. It's going to come out, come out Friday. Mm-hmm. Record and drop it Friday. It's going to be fun. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, so we're going to talk about the, the new film, The Last Jedi, and then, of course, we will announce our next episode, like our next full episode. We're going to, we're going to say goodbye after a long one. <laughs> Remember to be kind. And always rewind.